Uh, if you have your Bibles, we're going to go to Numbers chapter 22. Uh, we're going to read the first 10 verses of this chapter. Uh, I will be reading from the New Living Translation. If you don't have your Bibles or what, they will be on the screen. But if you have your Bibles, if you're at uh, uh, Numbers chapter 22, let me hear amen. Amen. Say, it's good. You can have your, your, your physical Bibles. You can have your digital Bibles. It makes no difference. Just have your Bible. The Bible tells us in Psalms that we need to hide it within our heart so we do not sin against God. And I pray that every day of our lives that we're reading something about God, we're reading something of His Scriptures, and we're hiding that deep within inside of us. But if you have your Bibles, Numbers chapter 22, starting at verse 1, and this is what the Scripture says. It says, Then the people of Israel traveled to the plains of Moab and camped east of the Jordan River across from Jericho. Balak, son of Zippor, the Moanite king, had seen everything the Israelites did to the Amorites. And when the people of Moab... Saw how many Israelites were there. They were terrified. The king of Moab said, uh, said to the elders of Midian, This mob will devour everything in sight, like an ox devours grass in the field. So Bal- Balak, king of Moab, sent messengers to call Balaam, son of Beor, who was living in his native land of Pethor, near the Euphrates River. His message said this, Look, a vast horde of people has arrived from Egypt, they cover the face of the earth and are threatening me. Please come and curse these people from before me, for uh, for me because they are too powerful for me. That is a sermon within itself. Then perhaps I will be able to conquer them and drive them from the land. I know that blessings fall on any person or any people you bless, and curses fall on people you curse. Verse seven says Balak's messengers, who were elders of Moab and Midian set out with money to pay Balaam to place a curse upon Israel. When they arrived with Balaam, he says, uh, delivered uh, Balak's message to him. He said, stay here overnight, Balaam said. In the morning, I will tell you whatever the Lord directs me to say. So the officials of Moab stayed there with Balaam. That night, God came to Balaam and asked him, who are these men visiting you? Balaam said to God, Balak, son of the poor king of Moab, has sent these messengers. Look, a vast horde of people has arrived from Egypt, and they are covering the face of the earth. Come and curse these people for me. Then perhaps I will be able to stand up to them and drive them out. Verse 12 says, But God told Balaam, Do not go with them. You are not to curse these people, for they have been blessed. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I love you and I thank you. Father, I ask that you would just touch me today, that I could speak your word and only your word. Father, that I would not add nor take away. Father, that your anointing would come forth and you would anoint our ears to hear, Lord God, that it would get deep into our spirits and we would allow you to change us. Father, we love you, we thank you, and we honor you, God. Have your way in this place, whatever it might be, and we give you praise and glory in Christ's name. Amen. Now, just for the next few moments, I want to talk on you on a topic simply titled, When You Don't See It Coming. When You Don't See It Coming. Have you ever seen those videos online to where people are interviewing or whatever, and all of a sudden they get blindsided with a ball, hits them right in the face, or, or, or you know, somebody, uh, they're walking on the beach, and then somebody's running and, and tackles them from behind because they're not paying attention to what's going on? What happens in our man and our spirit when something happens and we don't see it coming? How bad does it make us feel? Last week, God spoke to us and reminded us that He knows who we are. He knows our name, and He has not left us out to dry. And I thank God for His Word last week. We might feel like every now and then, or maybe all the time, that we have been left out, but but He reassures us that we are not unknowns. He knows us, and He calls us His children. He calls us by name because He loves us so much. This message tonight, or today rather, uh, is a message that is not actually a continuation from last week, But I do believe God wants to piggyback off of what was said last week and to kind of lay the foundation of those thoughts and bring them into today. It's always good to know that we are not invisible, but it's even better to know that we are not alone. It is comforting to know that when we need help, real help, someone that knows our name is going to show up. Okay, I'm not talking about help when you go to the pizza place and you left your wallet at home and somebody buys you a piece of pizza. Some people might call that a catastrophe. You can't walk into a restaurant without money thinking you're going to... Have you ever done that? You ever gone to a store, you fill up your buggy, and you go to pay, and you realize, 
Oh my goodness, my wallet is at the house. I've done it. Absolutely, I have. I'm not ashamed to say it. But, uh, but, but I'm not talking about this kind of help. I'm not talking about help of uh, somebody taking the trash out for you because you don't want to get off the phone or, or somebody rescheduling a meeting or, or something of this nature because you're not prepared. That's not the help I'm talking about. I'm talking about when you really need help. Aren't you glad there's somebody there when you need help that's going to step up and do the things that they need to do? I'm talking about when you feel like the world is closing in on you and you have a limited amount of life left in your body and you're crying out for help. I'm talking about when you're going down and you have no more strength to pick yourself back up type of help. I'm talking about, you know, the commercials to where you have the button around your neck and you fall and you realize you do not have the strength to get up on your own. So you mash that button because you know when you mash that button, there's going to be somebody on the other side that's going to answer the call. It's going to send help your way. This is the kind of help I'm talking about when, when you feel like desperation is about to overtake you, but yet somebody steps up and begins to show you there is breath of life coming to you. God is trying to tell some people today to hold on because your help is coming. Your answer has already been given. We find this in Revelations chapter 5 when it says that for you were slain and by your blood you have redeemed people for God from every tribe and every language and every people and every nation. Jesus Christ was slain for us so he could be the help that we need. The, the answer has already been given to you. The answer to every problem that you ever have is Jesus. The answer to every problem and every bad feeling you ever had in your life is Jesus because he has already paid the price and there's absolutely nothing that can ever take that away from you. But we also have to understand that the, the, the Bible tells us that there's absolutely nothing new under the sun. And as we begin to read this passage, we begin to to see that the enemy is using tactics that we see today. And because we see them today, we already know that he did them back in the Old Testament when they tried to take out the Israelites. The same tactics were, were used by the religious leaders against Jesus, trying to derail him from his purpose and the plan that God had placed on his life. But the outcome is still the same. The outcome is still victory for us and defeat for the enemy because he has already won the battle that we are facing right now. We have to understand that no matter what you go through, no matter of what you're doing, no matter what you might face, the battle has already been won because Jesus Christ has already fought it. He's already won it. He's already gone back to the next place, getting ready to fight your other battle that you're going to face in the next couple of weeks or next couple of months or the next couple of years. Or some of you, it might be the next couple of minutes because as I'm speaking to you today, I can tell you right now, the enemy is going to come and try to distract you. The enemy is going to come and tell you that this guy is boring. This guy has nothing for me. This guy is not going to say anything. He's been here for, for almost a year and a half, and he ain't said nothing yet. What makes me think he's going to say something now? Because the enemy is trying to tell you that you're not worth God speaking to you. You're not that important. God's not speaking to you. But I'm going to tell you right now that every word that comes out of my mouth is coming from the heart of God. And every word coming out of my mouth is for every soul that is sitting under the sound of my voice being in this room or being online whenever they might watch it. God has a word for you and he wants you to hear him. What happens when you do not see it coming? We get confused. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 18, it says that a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. I don't know about you, but I've got some brothers that will stick out their necks for me. And the Bible just tells me that I have a friend. There's a friend in Jesus that no matter how close my brothers stick, my God is going to stick so much closer to me. And there's nothing I can do where he will ever turn his face from me because he loves me that much. Oh yeah, we can walk away from God. We can turn our face away from him, but there's nothing in the Bible that tells me he will turn his face from us and relieve his, um, of, of, of his love but his love is always there his love is, is ever faithful and, and, and it's long lasting because he loves you so much and you have to understand that no matter what happens you have a friend that sticks closer than a brother but we have to understand as we look at this text there is something very uh, significant that happens in chapter 22 how many of you have ever had a great victory in your life, right? We've had great victories. We prayed the, the walls down. We had God move and God do this. 
But we find in the scriptures here that there's a battle that comes right after victory. The devil's not going to let you sit here long enough and bask in the glories of God. He, he's going to throw something at you as soon as you begin to, to put a smile on your spiritual face and you begin to walk in the glory of God. He's going to throw something your way to let you realize he ain't really won the battle. He just took you to the next place. And this is where we find the Israelites in chapter 22. When we look at our text, we find something very interesting taking place. Something that we might experience ourselves, and sometimes we might even miss it ourselves. A battle arises right after victory. If you go back to Numbers 21, you begin to see what I'm talking about as Israel is making their, their plight and making their journey to the promised land that God has, has given them. There were certain places and certain uh, uh, regions and certain kingdoms they, they had to cross to get to where God has called them. Wouldn't you know that they happened to be enemy territories that they had to walk through, people that did not like them, people that did not believe in them, people that did not want to give them any form of, of, of grace at all. See, as they began to walk, Moses sent people ahead and said, hey, listen, king, let us stay on the servant's path and we won't even drink any water. We won't eat any food. If our animals happen to drink your water, we'll pay you for it. We will not get off this path. Just let us pass through. We're not staying. We're passing through. Somebody say, I'm ready to pass through. I'm, I'm ready to pass through from where God wants me to go because God is going to take you to places. But as you go to places, you're going to walk through some enemy territory because when you walk through this enemy territory, God is going to begin to show you that no matter where you walk, He is walking with you. Somebody needs to hear that because no matter where you are, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you face, no matter what enemy territory you go, as big or small, God is walking with you and His favor is upon you you and no matter what happens there's not anybody that's going to be able to stand up against God when God begins to move God is going to move and the enemy will get out of his way but if you read uh, chapter 21 you begin to see that these kings not only said no you're not going to pass but they begin to send their armies and their people said go destroy the Israelites we don't want them here so king after king, all the Israelites wanted to do was walk. They understood who God was. They understood Jehovah. They understood Adonai. They understood El Shaddai and how he was playing uh, in their hand and how he was doing the things that he was wanting them to see how he can bless them. But yet the kings of the enemy nations did not want anything to do with it. They said, you know what? If we let them pass, they're going to come back around and they're going to take our land. Let's kill them. Well, that's the wrong mindset to have when you're going up against God. Because there's nothing that you're ever going to do. I don't care how great you are. There's nothing you will ever do that will ever defeat God. And I want you to hear that right now. You cannot defeat God. No matter how powerful you might think you are, no matter how big the devils might be, they will never defeat God. And if you begin to read chapter 21, you begin to see that Israel completely annihilated the Amorites. And as they annihilated them, they took the land and they began to live there. They they took it. They said, all we wanted to do was pass through. But seeing how you wanted to come and destroy us, we're going to take everything that you got and we're going to count it as a blessing from our God because you are going to bless us in the middle of your place because we are the blessed of God. And they took everything. And so now here we come and, and Balaam begins to say, hey, wait a second. <laughs> I saw what they did, and if they did that to them, they can do the same thing to us. We need to have somebody come and stop them. Israel cannot catch a break. It seems like after the battles, all they knew in life were battle after battle after battle. They come out of bondage of 400 years. They walk over the Red Sea, and now they begin to fight among themselves as they have people trying to pull them away from the worship of God Almighty and try to go into to false religions and things of this nature. And now all the enemies of the world are trying to come against them because of they are afraid because they all, they all saw the hand of God moving on this people. 
Let me tell you something. You might not think the hand of God is moving on you, but if you're a child of God and you call him King of King and Lord of Lords, his hand is moving in your life. You might not be able to see it, but I'm telling you right now, other people are going to see it and other people take notice that there's something different about you and it has absolutely nothing to do with you, but everything to do with the one on high, everything doing the one that is living inside of you because greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. And here they are. They, they don't understand what's going on. So, so Balaam began to say, you know what? I'm going to get somebody that's going to stop these people. Sometimes when God blesses his children, I want you to hear this. Other people do not know how to handle it. Can somebody say amen to that? Somebody say amen. When, when God begins to bless you, there's somebody sitting on the side of you that don't understand how to take your blessing. And now they get a little jealous. They get a little upset. Oh, I, I, I'm preaching a lot better than you're shouting, but that's okay. I'm going to keep on going because I understand. I've been through it. I, I, not, not because I'm somebody, but I've been through just that. People not understanding. I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I'll be transparent. I've been the one person not understanding why God's blessing that person. Hallelujah. I know you've been there before, right? You've been jealous before, right? You've been envious of other people and how God's moving in their life, how God's moving in their church, how God's doing this and God's doing that. You're doing just as much or even more but yet you don't have the same blessings that they are experiencing for whatever reason. I do not know, but, but we have all been there sometimes. Sometimes we do not know how to treat the blessings of God in our own life. I'm going to take a five-second pause and let that just sink real, real, real deep into your, into your spirit. Sometimes we do not know how to take the blessings of God in our own life. Because sometimes you think it is your ability that has caused this stuff to happen in your life. Sometimes you think it is your talent that has caused this to happen within your life. Sometimes you think it's something that you've done and it's the favor of whatever that, that you have done that God is beginning to bless you. And because of that, you can just put your shoulders back just a little bit more and think it's all you. But we have to understand that every good gift comes from God on high. Everything that ever is good in our life is coming from Him. And there's absolutely nothing we can do to take credit for it. Or we can take credit for it, but we're just lying to ourselves. And I always tell my kids, be honest with yourself. If you're not honest with yourself, you'll never be honest with anybody else. We have to be honest with ourselves the way it is when we begin to talk about God. We find Balaam falling into this very category. He's a diviner, a sorcerer. He's a whatever else you want to call him. But he's one of these people that has a reputation of being able to bless and curse people by what he says. And, and so now Balak said, I'm going to go find this guy. I know where he is. And as I find him, I'm going to pay him a handsome salary, ransom, whatever you want to call it. So he will work on my behalf. Somebody say, Balaam got the big head. <laughs> Balaam got the big head. Oh, yeah, he was able to do certain things, and he understood who God was because when you begin to look at the Scriptures and begin to look, I believe it's verse 5 or 6 or 7, when he says, I need to go and, and ask the Lord. And that word Lord, when you go into the Greek or go into the Hebrew, you begin to see that it is Adonai, the, the, the existing one, that the true God, he understood who it was. He called him by his proper name, not a God with a little G, but the God with the great big old G that he understood who he was. So he, he was he was familiar with God. And because of that, he began to do things and begin to use his abilities for himself. We might be unaware of people that are in question. Because when you begin to look at the layout of the land, Balaam is 400 miles away from Balak. So whenever Balak said, hey, we got some hordes of people that come from Egypt, but they're going to overrun us. Balaam may have no clue who it was. It doesn't ever say in the scriptures that he understood who Balak was talking about uh, cursing. But, but 400 miles away, here he comes. He comes tracking along. And he begins to understand exactly who these people are. He said he sought the mind of God and was told to get away in Numbers twenty two twelve. After he prayed to God, it says, but God told Balaam, do not go with them. You are not to curse these people, for they 
have been blessed. It doesn't matter what the world wants to do to you. It doesn't matter what they're trying to say. When God blesses you, nobody can take that away from you. When God blesses you, there's not a curse from the pits of hell that can ever overtake the blessings of God in your life. God said, get away from them. Do not go. You cannot curse what I have blessed. I know who they're coming after. I know who they're they're trying to, to stop. But I'm telling you, they will not be stopped because I have given them a promised land and they will enter that promised land. You see, Satan will try to cover up your blessings with curses. You ever have something good in your life and all of a sudden all the bad stuff just starts happening? If you can say, well, maybe that wasn't God. Maybe that was something that just happened. And, and, and you begin to feel all the cursings of, of the Satan coming into your life. And he will try to get you to see through his tainted lenses. You see, Satan wants you to get, get your eyes a little cloudy so you don't understand and, and you can't see exactly what's going on in life. He wants you to begin to see the, what he sees and how he wants you to see it so you can begin to believe the lie. Now, now, now let's not forget about Balaam. He was not a holy poster boy, even though he knew the true God. You see, there's a lot of people that know the true God. There's a lot of people that believe in the true God. There's a lot of people that believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but they will never place Him as King of their life or Lord of their life, and they will never worship Him in that such. And because of that, they are just like Balaam. They might know of Him, but they do not know Him. And because they know of Him, they can call out to Him, and He might talk back to them for a moment. And He might try to get them to go on the right path so the wrong things won't happen in the life but when your heart is not on, on, on overdrive for God when God begins to speak to you you will not move that might be hard for you to understand it might be hard for you to accept but if your heart is not on overdrive you will not begin to move when God begins to speak to you and begins to ask you to do certain things you see Balaam is selling his talents to the highest bidder Oh, yeah, he knows he's got talents. He knows he's got some anointing, if you will. He's got some abilities. And he's selling them to the highest bidder. He's not an evangelist trying to reach people for God and trying to show them the true way. He is a man following his own desires and not the heart of God. But he knows God. He knows that he cannot cross God. And God said, do not go with him. Stay away. You cannot curse what I have blessed. So they leave. And they come back. Don't you know when you tell the devil no one time, he ain't going to leave forever. He's going to come on back just a little bit later and say, well, let me try this again. And this is exactly what Balak did. He sent more people, more prestigious people, and more blessing. Well, not blessing, but more money his way. Well, let me see if I can entice him a little bit more. And you see, sometimes when, when you begin to, to listen to this, because I, I have to tell you, I went to bed last night and God woke me up about one o'clock and I stayed up till almost three o'clock trying to, trying to figure out what's going on with this message. And, and this is the first time it's ever happened. But, but sometimes when God tells us no, but yet then another better offer comes our way and you say, well, you said no, God, but, but now here it is, it's even better than, than what was before. Is it really a no, or you, would you just test me? Maybe it wasn't the right time. That's what it was, right? Because it's all about God's timing. And because God said no the first time, it wasn't the right time to go. But now that the, the pot seemed to be a little bit heavier, now that the blessing seemed to be a little bit better, now it is God's time for me to move. And so Balaam begins to pray again. And you drop down to verse 20. And it says this, it says, that night God came to Balaam and told him, since these men have come for you, get up and go with them, but do only what I tell you to do. How many times has God come up to you? You've been going up to God praying for this and praying for that, and you've heard a resounding no in your spirit. How many times have you heard a resounding no? God says, no, do not entertain this anymore. And you leave for a moment. And you come back to God and you ask God the very same question. He just told you a resounding no. Why will God ever change his mind when he told you no the first time when you're wanting to do the exact same thing you was asking before? If he told you no before, the answer is still no. But he understood Balaam and he understands us. And because of that, he says, yeah, you can go. 
But only do what I tell you to do. Only say what I tell you to say. So Balaam begins to go. So many times we get off of God's will because we will not accept a no from Jesus. We will not accept no from our Father. And we go back and ask Him again. And we ask Him again. And we ask Him again until finally He says, yes, you can go. But there are stipulations. We have to understand that, that God it was trying to protect Balaam and even his self-righteousness and all his stupidity and stubbornness. He was trying to protect him. But yes, so many times when God tries to protect us, we kick him out the door. I don't need your protection in this, God. I need you to protect me over there. You see, sometimes battle rises and they come right after victory. But we always have to understand that his promises are there even if you do not hear it. His promises are always there even if you do not hear it. The enemy will try to get you to believe that it's all over. He will try to overwhelm you with thoughts that is worthless battles going on in your life and you're never going to overcome this and you're never going to come out of this and you're always going to be subjected to this and you're always going to have these chains holding you down. You're never going to be good enough. You're never going to be accepted by the people. But the Bible tells us that there's promises in His Word. I was doing a little study. And there's, there's a huge number of, of discrepancies in what people consider promises. But I found one that says promises of God to man. And there was almost 7,500 promises in Scripture of God to man. Do you realize that's over 20 promises a day, every day of the year, every day of your life, are promises in the Word of God. And the Bible tells us that God is not a man that he should lie. And if he gives you a promise, he's going to stay to his promise and he's going to see it through. But we have to understand that the enemy will whisper in our ears when things don't seem quite right. He will try to discourage you. The same way Balak tried to get Balaam to see things his way. And he goes back with the same stuff. In Numbers 23, starting at verse 18, it says this. This was the message that Balaam delivered. Rise up, Balak, and listen. Hear me, son of Zippor. God is not a man, so he does not lie. He is not human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Somebody needs to get that into your spirit right now. Has God ever spoken to you and failed to do what he said that he was going to do? You say, well, it hasn't happened yet. Well, I'm telling you right now, the scripture that tells me that he's not a man that he should lie, nor is he a human that he should ever change his mind. Has he ever spoken and not seen it through? He has never failed in anything that he's ever said, or ever set his foot out or hand out to do. He has always accomplished everything that he has set out to accomplish. And I'm telling you, you might not see it happening in your life yet you might not have have taken it deep inside your heart yet but he has never failed he will never fail and he will see you through no matter where you are he will see you through Balak is Balak is, 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 is on Balaam and Balaam saying listen he he has always carried out his promise he says listen I received a command to bless God has blessed and I can not reverse it Somebody needs to, needs to give a little, little, just a little quiet praise about that because no matter what happens, when God blesses, there's absolutely nothing any man can ever do to ever reverse the blessing that God has ever placed in your life. Oh yeah, you might be able to walk away from it, but there's not a man strong enough that can ever reverse what God has done in your life. You need to understand that. You need to accept that. Yeah, you might not be doing what you think you should be doing. You might not be reaping the blessings of that or, 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 or the fruit of that blessing but I'm telling you it's because you have not looked to him with all of your heart overflowing with the hunger and righteousness and coming after him with everything that you have because the Bible just told me right here that he has blessed and I cannot reverse it no misfortune is in plan for Jacob no misfortune is in his plan for Jacob. We can stay right there. We can bask in that the rest of our lives because the Bible tells us that he has a plan for us. It's a plan of hope and a future. It tells us right here, he has absolutely no reason and no plan to ever bring any misfortune into your life. 
No trouble is in store for Israel, for the Lord their God is with them. He has been proclaimed their king. God brought them out of Egypt, for he, for he, for they, uh, he is as strong as a wild ox. No curse can touch Jacob. No magic has any power against Israel. For now it will be said of Jacob, what wonders God has done for Israel. It just said that if, if like I said in, in um, Ecclesiastes, whatever happened back then, there's absolutely nothing new under the sun. If it happened back then, it happened right now. And the Bible says right here that what wonders God has done for Israel is the same thing for you. You might not understand exactly everything God has done in your life because if you did, you probably would feel so bad you would not even want to look into the mirror of everything God has done in your life. But He is the one that is going to give you a plan. He's going to give you hope. He's going to give you a future. There's no magic there's no there's nothing that can ever come against what he is going to do in your life it is a battle that has already been decided it is a battle that is out of the control of the enemy and he knows it and the battle is in our favor god has promised his children things that the enemy can never take when you begin to look at some of the promises god promised unconditional love in romans 8 38 and 39 says nothing can separate you from the love of god that is a promise from god on high god promised that you would never be alone in psalms 27 and 10 the bible tells us in deuteronomy that he will never leave you nor will he ever forsake you and if he said it then he means it now god promised you a future in jeremiah 29 11 god promised you freedom in john 8 and 36 it says he who the son has set free is free indeed and some people need to understand that you have come out of Egypt and if God has set you free you are free no matter what you have to walk through no matter what you have to face no matter who stands before you the Bible tells you you are free and you are free indeed just because you cannot quote every promise in the Bible doesn't mean that every promise is not yours the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 1 and 20 it says for all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes and through Christ our amen ascends to God for his glory every promise that was ever given every promise that is written in this book has been a, has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ and the Bible tells us has been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes why can nothing separate you from the love of God because Jesus Christ stretched out his arms on Calvary and gave his life for you and no Nobody can ever take that away. Nobody can go back in time and say, Jesus, you ain't going to die for me because he's already died. The Bible tells us in Revelations that he was the lamb that was slain before the foundations of the world. God knew that he was going to have to send his son. And because of that, there's not a devil in hell that could ever change that. I and mean, with every promise being a resounding yes in Christ, there is nothing the enemy can do or the enemy can say that could ever take away one promise from God to his people. Can I get an amen from that? You are his people. You are the one that he sacrificed his life for. Sometimes you don't know where your enemy will come. Sometimes that enemy will come from within your borders. Sometimes that enemy will, will try to take you by surprise. You see, every promise is yours in Christ. The enemy will not be victorious. You begin to look in Numbers 28, uh, 24, verses 10 through 13. You begin to see that God is not phased by the enemy that tries to stand against him. He is not phased by the enemy that rises up against you. There is no enemy that can stand up to him. The, as the song says, he has no rival. And he has no equal. Nobody can stand up against God. It doesn't matter how big they are. I, I can say this over and over. It could be 14 Goliaths standing on top of 14 Goliaths' shoulders and stand up and look God right in the eyeballs. And God said, you're still small. You're still defeated. You're still going to be struck down. You're still going to be a foe of mine. And there's nothing you can do. And I'm going to get the smallest person out there to cut you down to size. 
See, you ain't got to be somebody big. David wasn't somebody big, but he was somebody under the anointing of God that began to walk and do what God asked him to do. And he took the biggest giant of the day and he struck him down and took his own weapon and cut his head off with his own weapon. You see, the devil is stupid. You got to understand, it's okay to say that word. I know it's a bad word. We ain't supposed to say it. Kids, ain't no kids in here, I hope. But the devil is stupid and you need to tell him when he begins to come to you with those lies and say, devil, you're stupid. You lost every battle that you ever come into. You lost every battle that you ever come across Jesus. Jesus is standing there looking at you and said, the time is coming. The time is coming. Your, your time is coming short. I'm going to let you do what you want to do, but I'm going to keep you in. I'm going, I'm going to rein you in because you're not going to hurt my people. There is absolutely no misfortune that I'm ever going to send Jacob's way. When you begin to look at Numbers 24.10, it says, now King Bela flew into a rage because he went back. And he went back and he said, Balaam, you better curse these people. I'm sick of it. I done told you I'm going to give you my palace. And you go to verse 10. It says that King Balaam flew into a rage against Balaam. He was angrily clasped his hands and shouted, I called you to curse my enemies. Instead, you have blessed them three times. Hallelujah. Don't you know the devil's stupid? Don't you know that every time you try to curse one of God's people, it turns into the blessing because the Bible tells us what the enemy meant for evil, God meant it for good. And no matter what's going on your way, no matter what's coming your way, no matter what's in your life, when something bad's coming your way, know that God's right there and he's about to turn it into something good. But you have to keep your eyes focused on him. See, Balaam was doing exactly what God wanted him to do. And he says, now get out of there. Go back home. This is Balaam talking. I promised you a, a reward. I would reward you richly. But the Lord has kept you from that reward. Balaam told Balak, don't you remember what I told you? Even if Balak were to give me his palace filled with silver and gold, I would be powerless to do anything against the will of the Lord. I told you that I could only say what the Lord says. I, I am completely powerless. Now here's somebody that has some anointing, right? Here's somebody that has some talent. Here's somebody that has some get up and go, some unction in his junction. He has something that he had to give. But he said, I am powerless against the will of God. God's will cannot be changed. It is given to you. The Bible tells Tells us his calls are irrevocable. His blessings are irrevocable. Here we might see them and we think that the story ends, right? Because now, now Balaam's gone back. He, he's gone back. He's a poor man. He didn't get all his stuff. But see, we, we missed something very important within this account. Balaam finds a way around God to get what he wants. I'm going to stop for a second again. Let that sink in. Balaam could not curse God's people out of his mouth. But Balaam found a way around God to get what he wanted. Oh, come on, somebody. You know, you know you've done the same thing. You know you, you found a way to get around what God is asking you to do and what God is telling you to do. And, and you get around God and say, hey, hey, I got one over on him. He didn't see me coming this way. Because when you begin to read uh, chapter 25, you begin to see that Balaam told Balak how to make the Israelites go into unfaithfulness. He says, you need to have them go out with all the, all the women of your town and, and have them to have sexual relations. And, and those women are going to have them start worshiping false idols and, and fall into idolatry. And that's exactly what happened. You begin to read the first couple chapters or the first couple verses of chapter 25 and you begin to see that Moses began to understand what's going on, and 24,000 Israelites were, were killed because of their disobedience to God. But it goes even better because we have to understand that Numbers 25 is not the end of the story. I'm going to get to the end of the story in a second. But we have to understand in Romans 8, 31, it says, What then shall we say of these things? For if God is for us, who can be against us? Yeah, Balaam might have found a way to get around God and didn't say what, what, anything against what God was going to say. But he began to plant seeds of doubt and, and, and seeds of idolatry into the minds of the men there. And then they began to do the things that were planted. But, but the Bible tells us right there, for if God is for us, 
Who can be against us? Because we begin to find out, if you go to chapter 31 of Numbers, you begin to see that every person involved in this, Balaam and Balak alike, were killed by the Israelites for bringing this, this hardship upon the Israels. Because God said, I, I, I mean absolutely no misfortune for them. But we have to go on and says, the Bible tells us that Jesus is coming. He will come and he will call his children home. But before he splits that eastern sky, before the trumpets are heard throughout creation, he will make himself known to you. He will show up in your situation. He will show up at the right time. And he will cause your enemies to flee. He will give you the strength to defeat your enemies before they ever have a chance to come against you. He will cause your enemies to bless you. Come on now. When, when, when Israel were, were coming out of Egypt and all their enemies, what did they do when they came out of Egypt? They got blessed with everything. They got blessed with possessions. They got blessed with, with gold. They got blessed with, with live animals. They got blessed with everything they could possibly have. The Bible tells us in Psalms that he will prepare a table for you in the presence of your enemies. He's not going to take you off the battlefield. He's not going to take you off to some pretty little house. He's not. He's going to make you, he's going to make that table right in front of your enemies. He's going to begin to feed you right there in front of them. Because the thing about this that, that really struck me, and it struck me last night as, as I read this. How many, how many have you read the story of Balaam, right? Hey, you always thought I was going to talk about the donkey, didn't you? No, the donkey ain't got nothing to do with it today. But we'll, we'll talk about the donkey later. That'll be, that'll be another sermon. But the thing that got me about this is the whole time this was going on, the Israelites never knew it was going on. They never knew Balaam was sent to curse them. They never knew that Balaam was there looking over them and seeing them in three different places. See, Israel was so big. God had blessed him so many times. He went over on this mountain peak and saw a fraction of them. Well, then he came over to this mountain peak and saw another small fraction. Then he went over to another one and saw just another one. But, but the Bible tells us that he could not see all of the blessings of God in the Israelites. They had no clue what was going on. What do you do when you don't see it coming? What happens when you don't see it coming? They had no idea what was going on. But the Bible tells us in Ephesians 6 and 12, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. 2 Corinthians 10, 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not flesh, but they are divine power to destroy strongholds. We, we might not understand what's going on. We might not see what's going on. But let me tell you something. God knows exactly what's going on in your life. He knows every battle coming your way. He knows every weapon coming your way. And he knows exactly how to keep you safe. And has to keep you above, above everybody else. But we have to understand that we have to give ourselves to him with everything that we have. Because if we don't, we will turn into Balaam. Balaam knew God. Balaam understood God. The Israelites had no idea of what was happening to them. All they knew was all of a sudden, their men started going into idolatry. They started taking wives that were forbidden for them. They started doing things that God forbid them to do. And a feeling entered the camp. And Moses understood there was something wrong. And God said, this is what's going on. And he explained to Moses what happened. And he said, you need to kill every one of them that fell into idolatry. Those are harsh words. Not only would they kill the ones that fell into idolatry, but they're going to kill the ones that brought them into idolatry. Amen. They're going to take the ones that, they're going to take the enemies that began to lead them men, the men out. They're going to kill them too. And they killed every one of them because God said that he is going to bless his people. And when we begin to get off the path of God's chosen place and his chosen path, things begin to happen in our lives that we don't understand. What do you do when you don't see it coming? Derek, if you would come, what do you do when you don't see it coming? Let me tell you right now. In the air, right now, there are battles. There are swords being waged. There are swords clashing. 
heaven's army is fighting against the devil's army right now for your life. Well, I don't really believe in all that. That's okay. You ain't got to believe it. Just because you don't believe it don't mean it ain't true. There's battles going on for your soul right now that you do not see. Oh, yeah, you get some nudging here and there. A child might be causing you to feel this way. A spouse might be causing heartache to come your way. Friends, whatever it might be. But you see, God sees everything behind the scenes. Just like when the enemy came to go against Job, God knew what was going to happen. God knew Job was going to stand tall. God knew Job was not going to fall under the weight of what the enemy was going to bring his life.